A selfish spirit is destructive of Christian love. We must be concerned not only for our own credit and ease and safety, but for those of others also. And rejoice in the prosperity of others as truly as in our own. We must love our neighbor as ourselves and make his case our own. If I may ask you all to turn to Galatians 6. And may I ask you all to stand for the reading of God's word. Galatians 6. Galatians 6, and just the first two verses will be our text passage. So Galatians 6, 1 to 2, let's read these two verses out loud together. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You may now take your seats. Now this was one of the final statements given to the troubled churches in Galatia. Now, if you know the context of the book of Galatians, we know that the churches, the church itself and the churches around Galatia were being led astray by a group that we refer to as the Judaizers. The Judaizers were Jewish Christians who were trying to combine Christianity, which is the simple gospel of Jesus Christ, and combining it with traditional Ju uh, Judaism and the, their principles. They were trying to combine it with the law. They were trying to combine the gospel with obeisance to the law. These Judaizers, they were coercing and commanding the Gentile believers that they needed to be circumcised and that they needed to follow the law in order to perfect their salvation. Now we believe that justification isn't brought about by any outward work of our own. We believe that justi justification comes from God. We know that justification is an act and it's not a process that we have to keep uh, fulfilling every single day. Once we accept Christ, we are saved. That's the simple truth of the gospel. But the Judaizers, they were adding things to the gospel. They were overcomplicating the gospel. Now why turn such a simple truth into this complex weave of lies, really? Look at Galatians 6.12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. The Judaizers knew the truth. They were taught what the gospel was. But they compromised that truth in order to appeal to the, uh, the traditional Jews. They didn't want to get persecuted. They didn't want to get made fun of or condemned by the Jews. So they twisted the truth. And they terrorized, in a way, the Gentiles. Now, I say all this to point out that the Judaizers were far from what the Apostle Paul was describing in verse 2. The Judaizers were not burden bearers, they were burden givers. They didn't make life easier for anybody, they made life much more difficult for the other Christians, for the new believers. They had no interest in lightening the load of other believers. They only cared about themselves. They were selfish, and only wanted to save their own skin, only wanted to save themselves from suffering. But as God's children, we are not called to be burden givers, we are called to be burden bearers. And every single one of us here tonight carry burdens of our own. A burden is something in our lives that is difficult to carry because of how heavily it weighs upon our hearts and minds. I'm not talking about a physical burden. I'm talking about uh, something in your heart, something in your mind that just eats away at you because of how heavy it is on your spirit. They cause us hardship, anxiety, grief, and sorrow. Every individual here tonight carries a burden of some shape, some sort. In fact, the majority of us are not just burdened by one thing. I think all of us here have multiple burdens that we are harboring in our hearts. Maybe it's a present trial or a tribulation in your life. 
You're going through a season, a storm. Life is very shaky for you right now. Maybe for you it's a physical infirmity or a sickness. You're just in this, the past few weeks have just been a, you've had bad health. You've suffered with a, a physical infirmity and you just, you just can't get victory over it. Some of us, our burden might be a sin that just keeps plaguing our hearts and that we just cannot defeat ourselves. Maybe it's negative emotions. Maybe you have unsaved loved ones that you know of that are not saved and are headed to hell and that's weighing on your heart. Uncertainty about your future, the present state of the world, financial struggles, broken relationships with people dear to you, past events that have scarred your hearts. These are all types of burdens that we carry. We all have burdens. Sometimes they start to pile up. They get, they get taller and taller and taller and heavier and heavier and heavier. And many of us get tempted to just drop out of the Christian race because of how difficult it is, because of how heavy our heart is, because of the fact that we can't see victory. These burdens are so cumbersome that many drop out of the Christian race because of how tough they are. Some people, they've had to even take their own lives because of how crushed they felt, how helpless they felt under the weight of those burdens, and they felt unable to do anything. Let me emphasize this one truth. One person can only carry such heavy burdens for so long. Physically speaking, the strongest men in the world, and I'm talking the giants that walk on planet Earth, six foot nine, six foot four, these strong men, the very strongest people in this world can physically only lift a thousand pounds. And they dedicate their entire lives to doing this act, one act of lifting as much weight as possible. But you know, in order to lift such weight of a thousand pounds, they dedicate their entire lives. They use 110% of their effort just to get it up for even a couple of seconds. In the grand scheme of things, even the strongest people in the world are finite. Even the very, very strongest men in this world are still not omnipotent. They are finite and weak creatures at the end of it all. The older we get, the more we notice our finiteness, how weak we are. Now, I'm only 23, but I sometimes I wake up with aches and pains. A couple weeks ago, I yawned, and it ended up spraining my back. For three days, this guy at the dollar started making fun of me because I was walking like, uh, like I was just ran over by a car. But that was a random thing. I never yawned when I was a teenager and I sprained my back. This was a recent development from age, I guess. But I'm assuming that it only gets better, right? Yeah, it gets better, yes. But the older we get, the more we notice our finiteness. And we, Pastor White had those pictures up earlier of them looking at themselves when they were younger. And sometimes when you look at your past self and you look at your present self, you notice all the things that you can't do anymore. We are finite beings. Our physical bodies are incredibly fragile. But I believe our minds are much more fragile. When the burdens start to pile up, it will become too heavy for you alone to carry that weight in your heart. So what can we do? I read a quote here that I really liked. The added strength and encouragement of others is often the difference between pressing on and giving up. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we have a part to play in bearing the burdens of other believers. As Paul advises, I think tonight we need to learn how to be burden bearers. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you Lord, for this message that you've placed on my heart, this precious truth of our responsibility of bearing the burdens of one another. And Lord, we, we know that you place these burdens in our life for a reason, to grow our faith, to strengthen us personally and individually. But Lord, I pray that you allow us to realize this important truth of helping one another to bear the burdens that, you, that are placed in our hearts and lives. I pray that you speak through me uh, this afternoon, and I pray that you speak to the hearts of those uh, in the seats in the congregation, and I pray that you would speak to their hearts as well. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Now look, at, look with me again in verse 1. This is our first point of the night. It says, If a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. In the spirit of meekness. The first thing I want us to notice is, ye which are spiritual refers to every single believer. If you have accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are included in this command of restoring others. Ye which are spiritual. Now, to restore others, you can't just do it with any sort of spirit. Paul advises that we have to do it in the spirit of meekness. In the modern day, meekness has been equated with weakness. In the corporate world, you could even say that it is disadvantageous to be meek. In order to be the CEO or the top of the business chain, a lot of these guys, they advise you that you need to be cutthroat. You need to be willing to step on others so that you can get ahead. There is, they say that there is no room for meekness as a leader. They discourage people from being meek. Honestly, our world looks down on those who are meek and submissive. They look down on them, they, they devalue their worth. Our world favors the proud. Our world favors the bold. We don't favor the weak and the, the, sorry, the meek. But folks, in the things that actually matter, meekness isn't weakness. It is one of the most important virtues. The most powerful, powerful man that has ever walked this earth exemplified meekness, and all throughout his ministry, his meekness affected what he did. And that man was Jesus Christ. This spirit of meekness or humility is important, especially when it comes to the matter of burden bearing. Now, when I say the word meek, and when I say the description meek, which person besides Jesus do you think of? You can say your answer. Who do you think of when you, when you hear the word meek? Sorry? Dalai Lama? Uh, not quite. I think of Moses. Okay? So he's in the scripture, not the Dalai Lama. But a lot of times, usually regularly, when we say the word meek, we think of Moses. And why is that? Let's turn to Numbers 12.3. I don't think we'll find Dalai Lama in this passage. but Now, uh, Numbers 12.3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. And you might be thinking, wait a minute, Moses was the one who wrote Numbers. So isn't he just complimenting himself and giving a self-compliment? Uh, but no, it was God moving him to write these words. And God recognized the fact that he himself was a very meek man. What I find interesting, however, is that God chose this type of man to be the leader of Israel. He didn't choose a, a fiery, confident leader who was a go-getter. He chose, in a way, quite the opposite. He chose a meek and lowly man named Moses. Why is that? Because even though society may insist that meekness is weakness, God knows that meekness is an important trait for all leaders. The original definition of the word meekness is in reference to a horse that has been broken. So who, know, who here knows what I mean by a broken horse? Okay, so I think the majority of us, uh, even though we didn't raise our hands, but I think the majority of us know that what a broken horse is. The doll looks very lost. I don't think he's heard of that. <laughs> now, physically speaking, a horse can completely uh, destroy the rider who's riding it. A horse is bigger than a man, a horse is faster than man, and a horse is much stronger than a man. With one strike of his hoof, he can completely destroy a man. People have actually gotten very seriously injured from, you know, they pet a horse in the behind kind of area, and then they get this, the horse gets surprised and he gets kicked, and it launches them. It's actually so interesting how far they get launched. It's not funny, by the way, but it's like, it's very interesting as to how powerful the legs of a horse is. 
So physically speaking, a horse has much more power than the one who broke it, than the rider. But the reason why meekness has come to refer to a broken horse is this, because the horse has the power. He has the physical strength to destroy the rider. But it chooses not to. It submits to the rider. It's submissive. It has the power to destroy, but it chooses not to. Pictorially, that's what meekness is, an, a broken horse. As the leader of the nation, Moses had all power. He had all authority over the nation of Israel. He could have ruled with an iron fist. He could have persecuted the people of Israel. But he didn't. That's not how he ruled. Because of his meekness, he led with a servant's heart. He was there for the people. He cared for the people. He interceded for their behalf. When they had a complaint, you know who would be praying for the, the nation of Israel? It would be Moses. He could have used the power he had to lord over the nation of Israel, but he chose not to. Moses instead sought to bear the nation's burden all on his own. In order to effectively bear the burdens of others, we must adjust our attitudes and display a spirit of meekness and not the opposite, which is a spirit of pride. We can't hope to minister to other people in the spirit of pride. Pride is often the result of having a self-centered attitude. The two go hand in hand. If you think the world revol revolves around yourself, you're going to place yourself higher than others. If you think the whole world is spinning around you and, and everything matters, uh, uh, and everything is centered around your personal life, you're going to place your own self above other people, naturally. It's just kind of like the Judaizers. They were self-centered. They chose to persecute Christians because they, didn't, they themselves didn't want to get persecuted by the, the traditional Jews. When you are prideful, when you are self-centered, you will do everything within your power to make your life comfortable, but only your life. You don't care about your neighbors, you don't care about your friends. When it comes to other people's problems, self-centered and pride has no room because you become indifferent and apathetic to your, your fellow man. You don't care what they're going through. You don't care their, about their struggles. You don't care about the feelings that they're harboring inside themselves because you only care for yourself. Get rid of the spirit of pride and self-centeredness. Philippians 2, 3-4 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Matthew Henry, on, this, on his commentary of this verse, he states, A selfish spirit is destructive of Christian love. We must be concerned not only for our own credit and ease and safety, but for those of others also. And rejoice in the prosperity of others as truly as in our own. We must love our neighbor as ourselves, and make his case our own. Now why should we put so much effort in becoming burden bearers? We already have burdens of our own. We already have things that we are going and dealing with. Why take all of that effort to bear the burdens of other Christians to, and to make our own life more burdensome? You know why we do that? Because Christ was the exact same way. Philippians 2.5, the same verse that we find, the, the verse that we have to look on the things of others, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This entire passage of Philippians 2 emphasizes Christ's humility. In verse 7 it says, But made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant. What made Joseph... Uh, what made Moses and Jesus great at bearing burdens is because they both had meek, they both had humble and self-denying attitudes. They didn't place themselves above other people. They placed others before themselves. They cared not for their own reputation and well-being, but they cared more for their fellow man. They were true burden bearers. Meekness is not a weakness. It is the instrumental trait that will help us become greater 
at bearing the, bur the burdens of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So that was our first point, is the spirit of meekness. But our second point is this, strength in numbers. Now, no matter how great of a man you are, as I've said, you cannot bear the burden of a whole nation by yourself. No matter how renowned you may have been, no matter how physically or mentally more gifted you are than other people, again, you are still finite. Let's go back to the example of Moses. As I've mentioned, someone I consider to have been a burden bearer is Moses. But no matter how great Moses was himself, and we all view Moses as a great man of God, no matter how great he was, he was still one man. And eventually there came a point that he reached his limit. Let's turn, with a, let's turn there in Numbers 11. In Numbers 11, we see Moses finally reaching his limit. In Numbers 11, 11 to 14, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servants? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? Have I conceived all this people? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? Whence should I have flesh to give unto all his people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. And in verse 14, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. Moses was a burden bearer. I think that's an undeniable fact. But because of his inclination to bear the burdens of others, eventually, because of his finite nature, of all of our finite natures, he reached a limit. He can't keep doing this by himself. He can't keep bearing the burdens of everybody all by himself. Everyone has a limit. But God didn't design one man to carry the burdens of many, or a normal man to carry the burdens of many. There is strength in Numbers, because in Numbers eleven sixteen, 16, God heard Moses' plea for help. Essentially, Moses was crying out to God for help. And this was God's reply. Numbers eleven sixteen, 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. God appointed 70 elders, 70 other men, 70 other good men were appointed to essentially help him carry the load of the entire nation of Israel. Because God knows that one man cannot accomplish the task of burden bearing alone. I just want to illustrate this with a physical example. So, Brother Andre, if you may, uh, Brother Dalla and Brother Cody, can you help him just bring up the weights over here? So God appointed 70 elders to essentially help him carry the load. Moses said that he couldn't bear the burden of an entire nation by his one self. And so God's answer to him was to appoint 70 elders. And you guys can just place it there. Thank you. And I just need um, Andre by himself, actually, as an as, as a illustration, you could say. So, in a way, I just wanted to illustrate that these weights that I'm using, I'm going to use them as an example of the burdens that we all carry. Because a burden is something heavy, right? So these are burdens that we have in our hearts that are weighing our hearts down. And eventually, one weight is not too bad. Let's say this 10 pounds of weight represents the financial problems that Andre is going through. He's in high school, he spent all his money, and now he's burdened by the fact that he has zero dollars. So, 10 pounds. This will represent the financial burdens that he's facing at this point in time. Is it heavy for you? You can still walk around and function with just 10 pounds? Perfect. Now, let's add another 10 pounds. Another burden pops up that really affects Andre's heart. He comes to school. He's being bullied. Don't laugh. Some people are laughing. Why is that funny? 10 pounds. You represent 
The fact that he's being bullied. Another burden in his heart. Maybe five pounds. This was rejection. Not, in, not a girl, but like just a rejection in general. <laughs> you guys are always assuming the girls, girls, girls. This rejection in general. He gets rejected by something. I'm not going to clarify. Five pounds. Something expensive that he owns gets broken, gets destroyed. It's starting to get heavy. 25 pounds. He loses a, he loses a loved one. The death of a loved one. And I know some, many of you can relate to having lost a loved one. And it's a heavy burden to deal with. If you add this on top of all the other burdens that he was facing, he's starting to struggle. I could have kept going and going. I had a lot of weights at home. I could have really made Andre suffer tonight. But, Andre, can you perform all your daily tasks with that much weight added to your, to your life, to your weight? This is debilitating. And I know I'm illustrating it physically, but honestly, the burdens that we face, the, the burdens of our heart, can be this heavy internally. Things are affecting us to the point that we can't do our normal tasks because of how much burdens we have in our heart. Now, Andre by himself, he's going to start struggling. Any moment now, his grip is going to start to weaken. He's going to drop those weights. What is there to do? This is where the Christian believer and brother in Christ, sisters in Christ can help. Brother Theo, come up for a second. Brother Theo represents another Christian who understands his responsibility of bearing the burdens of fellow believers. He understands that he has a role to play in the well-being of his fellow man. So Brother Theo, he helps in bearing the burden of Andre. Now, Brother Andre, does it feel much lighter? Perfect. Now, another one, and I'll finish with this. Cody, come up for a second, Cody. Help bear, bear the burden of Brother Andre. So how heavy is it for each one of you? Not very heavy at all. Maybe for Cody, it might be a little bit heavy. <laughs> but for Andre and for Theo, it practically feels weightless now. There's 70 pounds distributed between three people. The burden that initially weighed down Andre is now almost as light as a feather because of the help of other fellow believers. And you guys can just walk it over there. Thank you. There is strength and power in numbers. All of us turn to Ecclesiastes 4.9. And I ask, I'll ask you all to read this verse for me. Ecclesiastes 4.9 and 4.10. So 9 to 10. And may I ask you all to read these two passages for, my, for me. So two are better than one. Right? Ready, set, go. Two are better than one. And then let's also read verse 12 together. And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. There is strength in numbers. We are stronger when we are grouped together in unity than if we were to just operate solo and operate by ourselves and operate alone. Two are better than one. Threefold cord is not quickly broken. As a church body, we must unite in carrying each other's burdens. Andre, if he had to carry that, those 70 pounds of weight all throughout his life, every single day, eventually it will become too much for him. His legs will stop working, his hand will lose its grip, and he could no longer do the things that he wants to do. And I believe that there are all, a lot of people here tonight, to this afternoon, that have these internal burdens that is weighing you down as much as that, those weights were weighing down on Andre. We are burdened people. But folks, as Christians, let's understand that we all have a job and duty to do. Help carry the burdens of other people. Get to know what people are struggling with. Get to know their weaknesses that they, are, that they need prayer over. Help carry the load. 
Now here I end with the central point of this entire message. Notice with me this important truth. We started off with the spirit of meekness, that is what's important for us in bearing the burden of others. There's strength in numbers. Again, if the more people who bear a single burden, the lighter it becomes for the person. But the last point is the Savior who cares. God gave us the opportunity, the responsibility, and the ability to help shoulder the load of other people. But when you notice, when Cody and Theo came up, all they did was help carry the load. Was the load still there? Was the burden still there? Yes or no? Yes. Their presence did not eliminate the burdens. It helped. Let's not get this wrong. They helped in lightening the load of Andre, but they didn't eliminate the burdens of Andre. We do not have the ability to remove the burdens of other people. We can only help. It's like taking painkillers. After you suffer an injury, you just take painkillers. You numb your wound, you numb your pain, you numb your injury. It allows you to sleep at night. But when the moment the painkiller loses its effect, are you still injured? Yes. The painkiller didn't remove your infirmity. You are still injured. And again, the same way we can help bear the load of other Christians doesn't mean that we solve their problems and eliminate their burdens. And here is the most important truth this afternoon. There is only one who can truly lift our burdens away. Ultimately, yes, we have the opportunity to shoulder the load of other people, to bear their burdens, but also as Christians, when we have a burden, we ought to cast our burdens over to God. All the ladies... May I ask you all to turn to 1 Peter 5, 7, and all the men, may I ask you all to turn to Psalm 55, 22. So the ladies, 1 Peter 5, 7, <clears throat> men, Psalm 55, 22. Now ladies, may you, uh, you can read 1 Peter 5, 7 out loud for me. <clears throat> Okay, let's do that one more time. Uh, synchronize, ready, set, go. And then men, Psalm 55, 22. Let's read this out loud together. Cast thy burden to the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. What was the command given in both of those verses? It is to cast your care upon him. To cast our burdens to the Lord. Why? Because he cares for us. Cast all your burdens to the Lord. He cares for your well-being more than anybody else on planet Earth. Like the popular hymn says, burdens are lifted where? Burdens are lifted at Calvary. When we accepted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, He did not only save us from sin, from our sins, He did not only save us from a life of eternity in hell, but He also saves us from the present burdens that we face. He wants us to live a life of victory and freedom. Christianity is not meant to be a life of bondage and defeat. He wants our burdens. He wants us to cast our burdens to Him. Don't hold on to it. I know that we are always tempted to just keep our, our burdens to ourselves. A lot of times, people have told me when in conversation they don't want to reveal things about themselves because they don't want to burden me with their problems. But you know what? You can never burden God with your problems. Cast all of your burdens to Jesus. The second stanza of that hymn, cast your care on Jesus today, leave your worry and fear. You know, I can't just cast my burdens on Andre and then he can just run away with it. I will feel bad for the guy. Now he'll be the one burdened. But we can cast our care on Jesus today. We can leave it there. We don't have to get it, get it back and retrieve it and take it back home with us. When we willingly and genuinely throw our burdens to Jesus Christ, we can leave our worries and fears with Him. We can leave all the things that stress us out. We can leave all of the burdens that are weighing down in our hearts with Jesus. And He will take it from our hands. We can leave our burdens with Him. We no longer have to be controlled and weighed down by the burdens of our heart. 
As I've said, God designed the Christian life to be a life of freedom and liberty, not a life of bondage. This is the most important truth of the night. With that being said, I don't want us to forget our personal responsibility of bearing the burdens of others. There are so many practical ways in which we can help shoulder the load of other believers. But oftentimes, we make excuses as to why we can't help other people. I was reading the missionary letters that have been coming in, and there was a quote in one of them from a missionary that works with the Ukrainian refugees. We know what just took place in Ukraine. There was a war. Many, people were, many people's lives were affected. Many people lost their homes. Many people lost their loved ones. Many people lost all semblance of normality. And this missionary is ministering to those people, to those refugees. And in the end of his letter, he puts this quote. This is the quote that has powered him in his ministry. Love will find a way. Indifference will find an excuse. Does he have to help the Ukrainian citizens? No. He's not a Ukrainian himself. He could just go home, back to wherever he was, and act like nothing happened to the people that he loves and cares for. But he chose to stay and help. He chose to help the people and gather funds for them because of his love for them. He's willing to help shoulder their burdens because he loves them. Do you love your fellow man? Do you love your fellow believers? Because if you do, you will find a way to try and shoulder some of the burdens that they're facing. Let's evaluate, evaluate our life tonight. Are you following the example of the Judaizers? Are you a burden giver, making other people's lives more difficult? Or are you a burden bearer who is following the perfect example that Jesus has set before us? That's what. Thank you for watching the message today. We invite you to join us again every Sunday and Wednesday for more inspiring messages from God's Word. Thank you.